To meet today's energy challenges and become climate neutral by 2050, we need to speed up the clean energy transition of our economy. The Innovation Fund is one of the world's largest funding programs, investing in clean technologies to create green growth and jobs. It's 100% funded by today's heavy emitters through the EU emissions trading system. Implemented by the European Climate, Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency, CINIA, the Innovation Fund invests in projects for the decarbonisation of energy-intensive industries, renewable energy, energy storage and carbon capture, use and storage. Located in EU member states, Norway and Iceland, it is saving millions of tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions. Meet a few of the projects. The hybrid project is using fossil-free hydrogen to produce green steel. BCP is reusing waste heat to support the decarbonisation of flat glass production. Tango is creating Europe's largest factory producing highly innovative next-generation solar panels. Become one of them and help us reach net zero by 2050 together. Visit the Innovation Fund website today to learn more and apply to the next calls for proposals. Good morning and very warm welcome to this uh, uh, Info Day session uh, that is dedicated to our already third call for small-scale projects under the Innovation Fund. I am Roman Dobrava. I am the Head of Unit for the Innovation Fund at CINEA, Climate, Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency. And I'm so much honoured to see so many people connected today, uh, uh, showing the interest into the Innovation Fund. Uh, this uh, event today, and uh, also our call for small-scale projects, is extremely, extremely timely. Uh, we are really moving on with uh, decarbonisation of our economy, and we need to move faster. We need to scale up and deploy technologies uh, of tomorrow, already today, um, to fulfil our climate objectives. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of policy work uh, in this respect. Uh, Europe is uh, um, uh, advanced in setting up the regulatory framework for um, uh, supporting uh, low-carbon innovation uh, projects on the ground, and uh, we will hear about this in, uh, in the next, uh, next part of the, of the session. So, the Innovation Fund is there to support you, to support more of uh, uh, low-carbon projects on the ground. We have already uh, 46 small-scale projects in our portfolio, uh, cutting across different technologies, cutting across di different uh, countries. So we hope that with this call, uh, with this current small-scale call, we get even more uh, in the portfolio and we will support more of these projects on the ground and therefore it's important uh, that we have this event today and again I'm really glad to see so many people connected and we hope that this will lead to many many interesting projects in the call. Okay let's uh, look at uh, our agenda today. Uh, we have uh, divided the day for you to three essential parts. In the first part we will give you a bit of a policy context. Uh, we will hear from our colleagues from uh, European Investment Bank about uh, project development assistance possibilities and we will present in a nutshell what this small-scale projects call is about so what sort of projects are we seeking uh, what are the key uh, framework uh, for for this call then we will have um, a session dedicated to two award criteria based on which uh, the innovation fund selects the projects we will look at the degree of innovation and the greenhouse gas emissions then we will have a short break and then the last part of the day will be dedicated to remaining uh, award criteria, project maturity, scalability and cost efficiency. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we will, uh, of course, be very keen to answer any questions that we receive from you. So please, uh, if you can, uh, just scan the QR code that you see on the screen to your mobile devices. This will take you immediately to the Slido session through which we will collect the questions and pose them on the screen and the speakers will address them uh, during the Q&A parts of the presentations. 
Or please, uh, if you can't uh, scan the QR code, go to slido.com. Uh, the event code is hashtag Innovation Fund Small Scale Call 2022. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate also to, to rank uh, or like the questions. Uh, obviously, those that will have the most likes we will pick up and answer live. Um, this event is recorded, uh, so you will have the chance to review the presentations at the later stage for your perusal. And of course, we will share all the slides with you through our website. We will publish the session and the slides there so that anyone interested will have access to the presentations. So that's a bit of a housekeeping. Um, and if we move to the next part, I would immediately switch to our next speaker. I'm very glad that Patrick Kolar uh, the Head of Department for Green Research and Innovation from CINEA is with us today. Patrick will give you a bit of an overview on the Innovation Fund and uh, on this call. Uh, Patrick, I hope you can hear us and see us. And with this, I'll pass the floor to you and I ask colleagues to move the slides for you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues dear potential beneficiaries and participants in the Innovation Fund program. CINEA is the European Climate, Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency and has a key role in supporting European Green Deal, being the EU focal point for green and infrastructure projects. CINEA manages several programs, such as parts of Horizon Europe, the new renewable energy financing mechanism and the innovation fund. To implement this diverse portfolio, both the staffing and the delegated budget of the agency are subject to the considerable growth. We started with around 34 billion euros of budget managed in 2020, and we expect that this would increase to 56 billion or even more by 2027. And the staffing will also increase correspondingly from around 300 in 2020 to over 500 in 2027. Currently, CINEA is managing more than 2,800 projects and the steady growth of the portfolio is expected to reach more than 4,500 projects by 2027. What is the role of CINEA? CINEA provides funding and green advisory services to potential beneficiaries. It also engages directly with beneficiaries and stakeholders by providing support all along the project's life cycle. We are also working on raising visibility of program results and providing feedback to the European Commission on projects and program implementation results to help them design new green policies. Last but not least, we also explore areas for harmonization and synergies between different programs that the agency manages and also beyond. Uh, next slide, please. CINEA will deliver European Green Deal through seven programs that we are managing. You can see them on this slide. So first, there is the Connecting Europe Facility 2 for Transport and Energy, Renewable Financing Mechanism, Just Transition Mechanism for Public Sector Loan Facility Pillar, Cluster 5 of Horizon Europe Program, the Innovation Fund, the LIFE program and European Maritime Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund. CINEA manages calls for proposals within these programs, some of which are now open. For example, uh, the call for Horizon Europe missions and several calls in European Maritime Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund, as well as the safe transport call. So in order to, be, to keep yourself updated, please check regularly CINEA website. Uh, next slide, please. Let me also briefly say a few words about the Innovation Fund past calls. The first Innovation Fund call for proposals was launched back in 2020, and we are now at the third edition of the small scale call for proposals and the sixth call overall. The five previous calls presented uh, three large-scale projects and two small-scale small project calls. 
we had almost 1,000 applications for these five calls. That resulted in a portfolio of roughly 70 projects launched. Thanks to all these projects, the portfolio is expected to reduce over 214 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Next slide, please. So here you can see uh, the spread or distribution of the Innovation Fund project portfolio. So these 70 projects that I mentioned already cover most of the eligible countries and most of the eligible sectors. For example, in energy intensive industries, all sectors are covered. We have the highest number of awarded projects in hydrogen with total of nine projects so far, but we also have projects in non-ferrous and pulp and paper sectors. Many of these projects fall under the renewable energy category. Six projects in manufacturing of components, four in renewable heating and cooling, four in wind energy, and so on. Last but not least, just to mention that we all also have eight projects in energy storage. But of course, this is not enough, and therefore we are very thrilled to introduce the current 2022 small-scale call for proposals. With an available budget of 100 million euros, we aim to support many more European innovative projects and companies. Also, we are looking forward, of course, for the beneficiaries that will be new to the program. And especially, we are looking forward for the participation of small and medium sized applicants and startup companies. I believe that we will get many high quality applications and hopefully also from applicants that were supported in previous stages by Horizon 2020 and other European programs. So let me wish you all best of luck in your applications. Now I would like to pass the floor to Alexander Paco, who is Director of DigiClima, and he will provide you with the current policy context. Thank you and enjoy the info day. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, and uh, good morning, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Alexandre Paco. I'm Director for Innovation in DG Clima, and I'm very pleased to be uh, with you today. First of all, uh, a big thank you to my colleagues uh, in CINEA for organizing this uh, info day. I think uh, this is a very timely and very important event to really help you uh, to put together uh, the best possible application for this uh, new call. Um, I am also very pleased to be with you to uh, give some kind of a broader context on where uh, this, uh, this event is taking place in terms of uh, both our climate but also our industrial policy uh, context. So um, my first uh, kind of slide, if it turns to appear. This, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, oh, no, it went. Too high. Yes, this one. Yes, this one is uh, basically our pathway, our roadmap for reaching our climate objective, which is climate neutrality by 2050 and at least minus 55% by 2030. And as you can see, we are moving in the right direction. However, uh, still a lot to do, uh, still a lot to happen. This, is re this will require uh, big efforts, big investments in all parts of the economy. The good news is that we have now all the regulation in place to achieve our 2030 target. So the Fit for 55 package has been approved. Uh, you saw probably last Tuesday the European Parliament uh, adopting, approving uh, the ETS review in particular and with an overwhelming uh, majority really showing that uh, politically uh, there is a strong backing for our climate agenda and our energy also uh, agenda. Uh, the legislation on renewables, on energy efficiency have also been approved. So we have now all the pieces of the puzzle in terms of uh, regulation to provide clarity, certainty for investment to, to happen in, in Europe. Now, the next step is of course implementation. This is the number one priority uh, for all of us now to make sure that uh, this legislation is uh, going to really bear the fruit that uh, we want it to, to happen. And for that, of course, uh, the sectors covered by the uh, Innovation Fund are absolutely critical. So to decarbonize the uh, industry sector, 
is absolutely essential. And also, you will see in a minute that uh, uh, the importance of the Innovation Fund has been um, very much uh, understood and even strengthened in the, in the negotiation on the, on the legislation. And um, with the Innovation Fund, we can really address the key sector, be industry, be renewables, uh, be energy storage, and the NCCS. And Innovation Fund is really one of the key tools to really uh, support financially investment uh, taking place. So um, what happened in the last couple of months, sorry. <laughs> this one, yes. What happens in the last couple of months is as part of the revision of the legal framework, uh, the co-legislators have decided to, first of all, increase the size of the innovation because of its importance for, for decarbonization of industry, but also to extend the scope. So for instance, the maritime sector is going to be covered by the, by the funds. We will also have to uh, apply uh, strictly uh, some criteria linked to the taxonomy, the do not significant harm uh, criteria. And medium scale projects will also be, be supported in, in the future more specifically. A very also new element of the Innovation Fund is the introduction of new uh, financial instruments, uh, the so-called uh, competitive bidding uh, mechanism. And here I will uh, inform you in a minute on what are our, our plans uh, in that context. And finally, a very important point as well um, is that we need to ensure that the Innovation Fund really uh, brings a good balance uh, geographically across Europe so that we can support projects all across Europe and we will be very vigilant in, in the next years to ensure that uh, over the years uh, we have also a very good uh, distribution of support across sectors and, uh, and across, uh, across member states. So uh, the next slide is basically uh, a summary of, um, of the new uh, innovation fund but I think I have to struggle really with this yeah, little yeah. machine. Maybe you help me, uh, Roman. Maybe you do it. Yes, you do it. Okay, so uh, one up, up, up. Yes, this one. So this one is, I think, a very good summary of this new innovation fund. I could call it 2.0, the revamped innovation fund. So with increased uh, budget, so about 40 billion euros with a carbon <coughs> price of 75 euros per ton. Um, with an increased uh, scope, as I said, and with the possibility for uh, having also a um, competitive bidding mechanism used as an instrument to, to support uh, industry. So in the next step, in the next slide, sorry, um, I would like to also um, explain to you that the Innovation Fund is a very key instrument to uh, decarbonize our economy but also a very important instrument in terms of our industrial uh, policy. Um, and here, um, what has happened during the last couple of months in the Commission is that we have really taken, taken very good care about what is happening globally on this race for uh, clean technologies. And you have all seen that uh, the US has uh, enacted the in Inflation Reduction Act China also very active in the front of supporting clean tech manufacturing in their, in, their, in their country. So there is increasing competition globally uh, for manufacturing of uh, clean tech uh, technologies which are going to be so important for us and for the world to basically meet our, our climate and energy uh, uh, targets. So uh, this is good news. It is very good that other parts of the world really invest in this uh, technology. Uh, at the same time, it is competition. And it means that Europe needs to be really ready uh, to really be the home of uh, clean tech manufacturing. We cannot rely on imports of these key uh, technologies. They are so essential for our industry, for our uh, economy, that we need to make sure that this happens also in Europe. And this is why um, at the beginning of this year, the Commission adopted this Green Deal Industrial Plan, which basically uh, provides the key pillars, the key foundation to make sure that Europe really is the home on, of clean tech and industrial innovation for, for our future. 
And this requires a clear regulatory environment with uh, permitting, which is uh, going to be fast-tracked for these key type of technologies. It requires financing. And here, uh, what has been proposed is uh, a revision of the state aid rules so that uh, it is now simpler to support this type of projects. It means also uh, making the Innovation Fund a center part of uh, the EU action to support these technologies. In terms of skills, we also hear a lot of needs to um, deploy more skills in this uh, sector. And this is why the year 2023 is the European Year of Skills. And uh, the Commission will also, uh, together with the key stakeholders, develop some academies to really uh, support the reskilling and, and upskilling of, of workers in this particular sector. And finally, trade policy will continue to be a very important uh, instrument in terms of existing trade ag agreements, but also to combat, combat uh, unfair uh, trade practices. So that's the plan. Now, uh, how to make it happen in reality? The next slide, please. Um, the next slide is about uh, the Net Zero Industrial Act that was approved, adopted, and proposed by the Commission uh, mid of uh, March of this year. And it is basically putting into legislation what I just described you in terms of faster permitting, in terms of uh, uh, making uh, financing uh, easier for key uh, strategic projects, and also defining uh, eight specific areas which are considered to be of strategic importance for Europe. Here you see uh, solar panels, uh, biogas, heat pumps, uh, wind energy, electrolysis, uh, battery storage technologies, grids, and CCS. And you will recognize that many of these technologies are the key technologies we want to support with the Innovation Fund. So with its, this act, uh, Europe will be uh, more fit for the competition globally, and the Innovation Fund will play an even increasing role to support this uh, rollout of, of technologies. In the next slides, uh, you see also a new uh, policy development in the Commission in the form of the Hydrogen Bank. Uh, this was announced last year uh, by our President, and now with a new communication in March this year, we explain how to make it happen in practice. This is not a bank in terms of a commercial bank, but it's a bank in terms of really supporting uh, matching supply and demand and creating the new market, because hydrogen will be one of these key technologies necessary for uh, meeting our objectives, uh, climate and energy object objectives. And in that hydrogen bank, the Innovation Fund will play a key role because this is going to be the domestic uh, leg of this bank. This is through the Innovation Fund that we will uh, implement the bank. And at the end of this year, we will have the first auction for uh, the production of uh, green hydrogen to take place. So this is going to be one of these first new element uh, after the uh, revision of the ETS and uh, creating this new market uh, across, across Europe. So my last slide is about uh, the key steps ahead of us. Uh, we will prepare the next calls. So now you are talk we are talking and presenting to you and responding to your questions about the third uh, small scale call, but there will be some more to come and we will be having with you a workshop on the 13th of June to think strategically how do we plan ahead uh, this next call under the Innovation Fund to really respond to these key uh, policy uh, challenges that I've explained to you. We will also uh, launch the uh, competitive bidding for hydrogen and uh, we have to do some regulatory work to make the Innovation Fund really fit to uh, the new uh, framework uh, under the ETS. We will continue the dialogue uh, with member states and offer you uh, project development assistance, as uh, the EIB will explain to you uh, uh, later this morning. But uh, the purpose of today is really to make sure that you come with very good, solid projects uh, to really contribute to this transition. So thank you very much. Uh, have a good day. Really benefit for this day to ask as many questions as you can. Uh, and I'm sure the colleagues uh, from CINEA and the colleague from DG Clima will, will be uh, able to, to help you. So thank you very much, and have a nice day. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander, for this uh, uh, very nice overview uh, of uh, really dynamic uh, evolution in, in the Commission policies, uh, which will have 
obviously a strong knock-on effect on the markets, on our businesses, on the way how we prepare, how we implement the projects. And uh, I think this gives a good picture also why uh, we are now here today. And uh, as uh, uh, Alexander said, I would also echo, please follow us today, uh, ask many questions. And most of all, uh, uh, we do expect many good projects coming from this small scale call. Now I just check with the uh, colleagues with the next speaker, Zoran Stanic, who is the head of unit for the Innovation Fund at the European Investment Bank is connected. It seems to be the case. Zoran, you will uh, tell us a bit more about the project development assistance support that the European Investment Bank is providing. Uh, so I have passed the floor to you. Thank you very much, Roman, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, so my name is Zoran Stanic. I'm head of unit for the Innovation Run Fund support. Uh, we are providing this uh, project development assistance already now. This is the third year, and we are very happy with our cooperation with the uh, DG Klima and also with Sinea. So in this presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit how does it work, and we'll also give uh, uh, some examples. So. Our role is actually to support projects to reach higher level of maturity through various uh, set of services, both technical and uh, financial. And we are entrusted uh, by the Commission, by the delegated regulation. And this set of service, for example, uh, improving feasibility of the project or building a financial model, you'll see later in the in the slides. This is implemented either by our own expertise or by uh, additional, let's say, external consultants. Next slide, please. So there are various criteria uh, for, the, for the PDA. As you know, from the calls uh, that the project should reach a minimum threshold in the in the in the in the key uh, criteria of greenhouse gas emission avoidance innovation scalability and cost efficiency and should be at least 50% uh, for the maturity criteria uh, and they should be also considered by sina evaluators of having potential to improve the, the maturity. So basically, this input for us is crucial to have a good understanding uh, of the project and kind of a good uh, uh, guidance from the evaluators in which uh, parts of the project, the maturity improvement is required. Next slide, please. Here you see uh, so far uh, uh, what kind of projects we supported. In total, we screened based on the inputs uh, from uh, from Cinea uh, evaluation. We screened uh, almost 60 projects so far. Out of these 60, around uh, up to 30, I would say a little bit more are currently either fully completed or in the in the execution phase. And uh, based on the award decisions uh, from uh, from European Commission, uh, this is the breakdown basically of the various sectors and also uh, in terms of geography, uh, how many projects we, we are supporting. You can see here that clearly certain sectors are, are really uh, in a way most popular. Hydrogen energy intensive industries, storage as well. I would say these three really uh, key sectors got uh, most of the PDA support so far. In terms of geographical uh, distribution, you see, for example, that uh, Spain is, is very successful in, in, in getting PDA and also uh, big countries, which is kind of uh, not surprising because they, they, they also prepare most of the applications for the Innovation Fund. Scandinavia, also uh, Germany, Italy, France, but we have also other countries like uh, Greece. Uh, we have some other countries which which have uh, also uh, PDA projects. Next slide, please. So here are the examples of really what kind of support is provided. As I mentioned, uh, we have independent 
let's say, technical uh, reviews, uh, financial studies like review of the financial model uh, or development of the model from the very beginning. Uh, we have various feasibility studies uh, or market research studies or business plan assessment. So all this uh, kind of direct support is, is possible uh, for the for the selected projects. Next slide, please. So here is the one example. So this is a publicly available example of the of the PDA, which is done for the first uh, large scale project called Equity. And the project is uh, basically a European crowd balancing platform to allow electricity aggregators to participate in the electricity balancing market with sm smaller distributed energy resources like home batteries, electric vehicles, etc. So you see it's a very uh, topical uh, subject and also uh, So we, we did assessment, uh, analysis of the market, uh, uh, mapping of the aggregators, uh, assessment of the platform itself. And uh, you can see actually uh, really the whole study at this uh, website, which is provided uh, below. So the, the study is done in cooperation with the uh, Rumble which is consultancy company with whom we work uh, on this kind of studies. Next slide, please. So just uh, uh, key highlights. So the purpose of the PDA is to increase the, the project maturity uh, based on specific recommendations uh, with limited time and budget. Uh, Projects uh, receiving the PDA support can reapply uh, for the subsequent calls. And uh, projects can receive both technical and financial PDA support. What we should also say is that the, the, the total budget for the PDA is relatively limited. So it's not a big budget. Uh, in general, it is estimated that this uh, PDA will last for only uh, let's say four to six months. We have exceptional cases. We have more, uh, also more complex projects which which change, let's say, during the implementation. Also not surprising because the projects are in very early planning stage. So sometimes PDA can take a bit longer, but in general, it's a limited budget. So we, we really have to focus and to find the area where we can support most uh, with the PDA. In the end, what is what is important is that although PDA can support application in the next round of the of the of the calls for innovation fund, the final responsibility is always with the promoter. So we prepare the inputs. However, uh, EIB is not really preparing the application. So the, those inputs can be used uh, for the application. In, in the end. Uh, the final responsibility, of course, remains uh, with the promoter. Next slide, please. Okay, so I, I guess this was very kind of a bright, abridged uh, presentation. We, initially, we had more slides. Okay, it, it has been decided to to run it in a way uh, in a shorter version. Uh, what I can also mention is that uh, two. Uh, small-scale projects that were supported uh, by the PDA uh, got a grant in the subsequent uh, uh, application. So we have uh, some examples of the projects where uh, they are supported by uh, PDA, and uh, subsequently they also got uh, the grant under the Innovation Fund. We also have another project which was also very interesting, where, where it got on one hand, it got a grant for the small scale, but then the project scaled up 
and also got PDA for the large scale. So it seems that various combinations are possible. So PDA is actually something which uh, which is to be used as much as possible. So we encourage you also from that point of view to apply. I think that was all in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zoran, for being with us today, for connecting. Maybe just to give a, um, a, a couple of clarifications uh, so that uh, um, all people following us today have a full understanding. Uh, on each call uh, under the Innovation Fund, uh, we cooperate very closely with the European Investment Bank, who supports those projects that uh, unfortunately are not selected by us when uh, we assess them because uh, uh, the evaluators consider the projects not mature enough so that they could be supported by the grant. And that is where the European Investment Bank comes in uh, with the support provided through the project development assistance to help those projects move their maturity up so that they can come back in the next call and potentially be selected for support. And these were the two projects that Zoran was mentioning. And uh, yes, thank you very much for the cooperation and for being with us. And uh, let's move then to, uh, to the call itself. Um, and now I'm OK. I hope this is the correct slide. So uh, the 2022 small scale projects call, uh, it is a third call in a row. Uh, we are uh, doing this call, which is very similar to the previous small scale projects call. So those who know the conditions will not be surprised. Uh, the call has been launched on the third, uh, th 30th of March 23. We will close the call for proposals on the 19th of September of this year. And uh, the plan is obviously that we will announce the first results in uh, uh, last quarter of this year. The budget for the call is 100 million euros. Uh, this will be distributed to selected projects. Uh, what those projects uh, are, uh, I will mention later probably which type of projects do we want to support. But in essence, the eligible projects are those that have the capital expenditure capex up to 7.5 million euros. If you are above that threshold, if your project is above 7.5 million euros, then you should apply for the large scale projects call. Uh, if your capex is up to this threshold, this call is for you and apply. What do we finance under the Innovation Fund? Uh, we have uh, uh, up to 60% of, of your capital expenditure that we can support with the grant from the Innovation Fund. So if your capital expenditure is, I don't know, 7 million euros, we will be able to support you with up to 60% of that amount. Uh, what uh, is another important element to understand under the Innovation Fund? We are uh, mm, a program which finances projects based on lump sums. So we do not check your invoices, we check what you deliver. The program is uh, designed in a way that it follows very much the normal business investment structure of a project. We are interested in results, whether these are meeting your financial close, entry into operation, and then once operating, delivering the greenhouse gas emissions. We can pay up to 40% of the grant uh, at financial close or before that, if you have a milestone uh, before that is negotiated and agreed in the grant agreement. And the remaining 60% of the grant is paid out during construction and during operation, where we normally uh, ask you to reserve at least 10% of the grant for the period um, uh, after entry into operation. All the information, uh, the details, the material is available on call page. Uh, once the slides will be published, you will be able to click um, there and see all the material that has been published. And what are the award criteria based on which uh, assess the projects and then rank them? Uh, we have five uh, criteria. Degree of innovation, which is uh, to what extent your project goes above what is, uh, let's say, the market practice. Uh, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, avoidance criterion, which uh, on one hand side takes into account your absolute greenhouse gas emissions, your relative greenhouse gas emissions, but we are also following to what extent you follow the methodology that is prescribed for the Innovation Fund. So that's the quality of your calculation. Uh, we have significantly adjusted the scoring for greenhouse gas emissions avoidance to allow also to projects that have 
lower absolute greenhouse gas emissions uh, to be compatible and um, um, uh, comparable to those that have a large absolute emission. So we have reduced the score for that. Um, uh, you will see this in the call text. Uh, this allows the small projects, uh, uh, more innovative projects uh, that, for instance, have uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions in absolute terms still to be compatible and have a high chance to be selected. Then we have a project maturity criterion. Uh, as we mentioned uh, before, uh, our legal obligation is that we can only select projects that can reach financial close at the latest uh, within four years after the grant signature. Uh, if projects can meet this target faster, obviously this is uh, a bonus. We, we, uh, we will assess these projects more, uh, um, uh, more favorably, but uh, this uh, obviously needs to be uh, underpinned by evidence that the project has real chances to meet this point earlier. And uh, my colleague Kentan will give you more information in his presentation on this. So project maturity is an essential part uh, of the assessment and the innovation fund. We are looking for innovative but also mature projects so that there is a high chance that your project will succeed and go ahead as planned. Then we have a scalability criterion, which is in essence uh, uh, looking at what is the growth potential for your project in the future, what are the implications when it comes to resources, um, the costs and so on, once the project is scaling up, um, once uh, you replicate your technology in the broader terms. And last but not least, cost efficiency criterion, which is in essence how much does it cost the public purse uh, to reduce the ton of the CO2 of your project. So these five criteria are there in a way to enable a 360 degree assessment of your project. And you can see here that these criteria can balance out each other. So you may have a very innovative project uh, that is potentially uh, um, worse on the cost efficiency, but still, because we have these five criteria, uh, we allow these projects to compete and be compared uh, against each other in the final scoring. So I hope this is clear. Again, just to reiterate, eligible projects are those under this call that have the capital expenditure up to 7.5 million euros. Uh, we can pay up to 40% of the grant at the financial close of the project, and the rest is then distributed during the construction and during operation of your project. Where you can find information about the call, and uh, we have really tried and evolved over the last calls towards this call in preparing for you as much information in advance as possible. There is a lot of material available on the portal. Uh, you will be able to find a couple of tutorials there, whether this is related to application process, whether this is on how you fill in your relevant cost calculator, a very important file that is mandatory that you need to submit. But now you have pre-recorded tutorial there. Please have a good look uh, because it should help you to do this uh, uh, probably uh, in much easier way. And also you will find a tutorial on how to calculate your greenhouse gas emissions and how to fill in the GAG calculator for you. So those are already available on the, on the site. Please have a very good, good, good look there. Uh, we have also um, uh, prepared so-called self-check questionnaire. This is especially for the newcomers, for the first time um, projects that are still unsure, is this program for us, is this not for us? Uh, please have a good look and uh, self-check yourself. The, uh, the, the questionnaire will not give you a um, um, definitive answer. It will rather uh, give you some orientation to what extent the Innovation Fund is fit for purpose for your particular case. Then uh, we have this info day, but also um, we will have on the uh, 4th uh, and 5th of July a dedicated session for you. So this is planned in a way that now after this info day, uh, we do hope that you will start to prepare your projects, but with some time uh, you will be in into this uh, and we have uh, uh, 4th and 5th of July dedicated to specific session when we will focus on lessons learned 
on how to prepare a successful proposal. So we will really dig deeper there. Uh, we will provide you more examples, we will provide you more guidance, and on top of it, we will also allow um, uh, a direct interaction with potential applicants. There we will have so-called so orientation sessions where you will be able to register in advance and have um, um, uh, the chat, have, have the presentation of your project and exchange with us, where we will try to guide you further on how to prepare a successful project. We will publish all this information about the next event soon. So watch us, uh, watch our website. You will have all the information there. But you see there is a lot already out there for you. So our uh, recommendation is obviously first have a very good look on those materials. Um, and then uh, obviously we will be uh, at your disposal. What sort of projects are we funding? Uh, mm, you will see this in much more detail in the call text. But in essence, we are covering renewable energy, we are covering energy intensive industries, uh, CCUS, energy storage manufacturing. So these are, let's say, the, the key, I would say, sectors, areas where your projects uh, should be sitting. In essence, in substance, we are looking for innovative projects. In the case of small scale projects call, we are looking to projects that go beyond the, uh, the state of the art at European or national level. So you will need to compare with potential competing technologies even at the national level, allowing especially projects from countries where we have less representation in the portfolio. The Innovation Fund does not regulate which technology is eligible and which is not. Okay, this is not our case. We are technology agnostic. What is important is that your project will lead to tangible greenhouse gas emissions avoidance, that your project is mature enough and that your project is innovative. And we are obviously looking for projects that make economic sense. So uh, unlike uh, in, in, in some other programs, uh, we do not regulate how your consortium should look like. How many people, how many organizations, how many countries should be there. <clears throat> this is entirely your call. And the underpinning principle is that the project should have an economic and environmental sense from within. The project must be coherent when it comes to objective, but also to delivery. Project must be well funded. Obviously, you need to have good partners behind you because we are looking for mature cases. So I think this was helpful. I hope this was helpful uh, for you. Uh, now, on the award criteria, I mentioned we have five of them here, a bit more in detail, um, but colleagues will also go in much more details later, so I don't think we need to repeat again. Uh, maybe a couple of remarks. What is new compared to the previous previous calls? Uh, I mentioned that we already have a number of uh, small-scale projects in our portfolio from the previous calls. So we are also asking you to look at the Innovation Fund dashboard. You will find the link in the presentation and see what is already out there because we are looking for projects that provide some reasoning why your project is different, why your project goes beyond what has been already funded to the extent possible, of course. Then on the scalability criterion, we have revamped this criterion in order to give more clarity to applicants and to the evaluators. So please have a good look to the call text. It's different compared to the previous one. We are looking uh, under the scalability to efficiency gains should your project be scaled up. What uh, is the implication on the resources? Obviously, there may be some limitations, and we want to be honest on that. And of course, what is the expansion potential of your project? And as usual, we are looking to extent and quality of the knowledge sharing because this is an important part of the Innovation Fund. We have a new structure in the call. You will find this uh, in the call text. We have three bonus points there that you can get should your project lead to, pot uh, to, lead to net carbon removals. And again, we will have more detailed explanation in the next presentation. Should your project lead to other greenhouse gas emission savings that would go beyond the methodology? Or should your project lead to additional renewable electricity or renewable energy sources used in your project? So these are the three criteria uh, or three areas in which you can gain additional points in scoring. And again, this is all explained in the context and we will have more details in the next slides. We will use the usual cascade approach that you may uh, already experienced in the previous evaluations. 
how does it work? First, we check the eligibility and admissibility. So is your project uh, located in uh, the EU member states, Norway, Iceland? Um, is your project about the technologies and areas that we have um, uh, prescribed in the call? Then uh, we will look at the degree of innovation. And if you pass the minimum threshold, you go towards evaluating the next criteria. If the score is below threshold, we will stop the evaluation and we will not assess the other criteria. And this is then applied also for greenhouse gas emissions and project maturity in the next step. Just to highlight that it's really important that your project proposal uh, is well presented, in particular when it comes to those uh, first two, three criteria, because they will uh, uh, be first in the cascade when we evaluate this project. And again, colleagues will give you more details about this in a short while. The selection procedure is usual uh, for any uh, other EU programs. Uh, as I mentioned, we have eligibility, admissibility, then we assess the evaluation criteria. This is done by external evaluators, by experts from the market. Then we do the listing of the projects that uh, are assessed, and either the projects are uh, invited to uh, the grant agreement preparation, those that are selected, those that are not, those that fail the project maturity, criterion may be awarded the uh, European Investment Bank's project development assistance and they will be notified in the letter to uh, those applicants uh, as relevant. Okay, so I think that's uh, about it and we can uh, go to a couple of questions that uh, we have received. Um, so, will we see them on the screen? Okay. The call says that applicants need to operate for three years. What does this mean? Laboratory operation, production and sales, something else? Okay, so the call prescribes that uh, uh, your monitoring period under the small scale projects is three years, which means that once you enter into operation, you need to uh, report to us for three years period of time when it comes to your achieved greenhouse gas emissions avoidance. This is a monitoring period. This is the minimum requirement that your project has a contractual relationship with us. So normally your grant agreement will be lasting longer because you will have the date of the signature, then time to reach financial close, then some time to enter into operation, plus three mandatory years of operation during which we will be monitoring your greenhouse gas emissions because, as I mentioned, we uh, have to check this uh, to ensure that uh, you meet your uh, promise and you need to meet at least 75% of what you promise when you submit your proposal to us. If this is going beyond 75%, we may reduce or recover the grant. I hope this is clear. Of course, your projects will have a normal life cycle, which will be much longer, but for the purpose to reduce administrative burden for applicants, we decided to have three years of monitoring period after you enter into operation, and that is mandatory. Another question, are greenfield projects eligible to this fund? A new electrolyzer, the answer is clear, yes, indeed. Do we have further questions? Okay, do we need to have a consortium with more than one country involved? If so, what is the minimum number? As I mentioned before, uh, we are not regulating this. This is entirely your call. It is your choice how you organize your project, whom do you invite. We are not requiring cross-border projects. We are not requiring that there are many countries involved. We allow single beneficiary projects here because what we look at is that the project has economic sense uh, beyond. So no artificial consortia. Please be very, very prudent when you are setting your project. What is important is that it makes economic sense, first of all. Can you apply for funding for part of a site or should it cover the entire site, being the part the innovative investment? Maybe, Kentan, you could look at this one. Um, it depends on how you set up the boundary of your project. Yes, that, that's really that. It, it's, really, it's really difficult to answer this question because we have first have to define what is the site. If you mean that could we apply for a part of an industrial site for a specific project, the answer will be yes. But the project you are presenting to the Innovation Fund has to be a whole project. It's, it's not, it must not and could not be just a, a small part of a project. The project has to be complete because the project will have to deliver greenhouse gas emission avoidance. And you could not do that with just a 
small part of our project. Okay. Innovation Fund is settled on a flat rate based. What does it depend on and what is the maximum advance paid for the start of the project? Okay. Uh, I hope that we gave a bit of an explanation. Um, the flat rate is the maximum that we can support, so up to 60% of project capex. If your project capex is 5 million, we can provide in a grant 60% of 5 million euros. Okay, that is the maximum grant amount. Now, you can ask for less, obviously. If you ask for less, your cost efficiency ratio will be higher. So there is a balancing out that it costs less the public purse to support, and you may score higher in this particular criterion. So again, this is your call. We are not regulating this. Uh, it will depend on the financial structure of your project, on your real need uh, to cover the costs that no one else can finance. Okay. There is no advance in the Innovation Fund. We have no pre-financing settled. Nevertheless, uh, we can start paying the grant um, um, once the grant, side, uh, grant is signed at an agreed milestone. So the first milestone normally would be your financial close. So you need to deliver all agreements necessary to start essentially ordering and building uh, your project. At that stage, we can pay up to 60% of our grant up to 40% of our grant, sorry. Uh, if you have a, a milestone before, which can be negotiated with us, we can pay at that stage as well. But there is no advance payment uh, essentially at the grant signature. This is uh, a program which is paying upon delivery. I hope this is clear. Okay, I'm looking at colleagues. We have no additional questions. So I hope this was, I hope this was useful and clear to you. Um, now I think we move to the next presentations immediately in view of time. And uh, we should start with the degree of innovation and greenhouse gas emission avoidance. I'm very happy to have uh, Maria Alfayet, the deputy head of unit for the Innovation Fund, and Joao Serrano Gomez from DG Clima, who will walk you through these two award criteria. And I pass the floor to Maria. Thank you, Roman. Uh, OK. so. Um, as Roman has presented, I mean, all the, the award criteria are important, but we are uh, doing the evaluation on cascading. Therefore, uh, it is very important that you pay attention to how to approach the degree of innovation of your project, because it's the first one that is going to be evaluated, evaluated meaning that it's a go, no go. So please be exhaustive and try to underpin all that you claim with evidence. This graphic, which seems to be complex, is, uh, on the contrary, a very good tool to help you uh, to build up your proposal. So let's walk through, uh, starting by the left part of the, the chart. And we have, first of all, uh, uh, step number one, which is to establish the relevant state of the art in a clear and comprehensive manner. This means that you have to look at two things. On the one hand, the technological state of the art and also the commercial state of the art. Uh, so for the proposal that you are putting forward, you need to uh, let us uh, now uh, put in your proposal uh, what you propose in terms of performance mandata, cost, uh, what is the state of the art for that technology in terms of performance data, cost, production characteristic, technology system readiness, and, and so on. And the same for the commercial state of the art. So this is the state of the art of that te technology that exists. Then you need to explain how your proposal goes beyond uh, the innovation uh, that exists. So uh, goes beyond what we call incremental innovation. Therefore, you will need to uh, identify which are the barriers for scaling up these innovative technologies that you are proposing, or what are the barriers for combining these innovative technologies that exist. And then we have the third step, which is providing the evidence, so the key performance data uh, that you have to include in your uh, documents, like uh, supporting documents, feasibility study, uh, providing this key, for key performance data for what you pre present. Therefore, what is going to happen during the evaluation is the comparison between this data that you are uh, producing for your own uh, project compared to the state of the art that exists. And uh, this uh, 
comparison with uh, the, 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 what is the state of the art existing, uh, technological and commercial, can be done uh, in two different uh, ways. You can compare with the state of the art at EU level or at national level. And this is very important because this is going to have an implication uh, in the um, threshold in the, in the threshold that you can meet or uh, the score that you, are, you can get. Uh, if you are comparing to the national level, you can meet maximum the minimum threshold for this award criteria. If you are comparing to the state of the art at EU level, you may receive a higher score than the minimum threshold. So please take this into consideration. Then uh, look thoroughly to Annex 1, because there you will have examples and a very good explanation on the degree of innovation and how to approach it. And uh, be transparent, be realistic with all the data and the information that you provide. Uh, yeah. OK, so uh, I mentioned that we are looking for uh, projects that go beyond incremental innovation. So we have here uh, the three boxes. We don't want those projects which would be in the left-hand uh, box, in the first box, incremental innovation. We are looking for projects that at least they have an intermediate or a strong degree of innovation or a very high uh, and a strong uh, breakthrough innovation. So this innovation can be uh, in terms of new technologies, processes, business model for production or delivery of new products or new services, but always going uh, this incremental innovation. So at least intermediate or strong degree of innovation and more chances if you really go uh, to breakthrough technologies. So some uh, questions that might be useful for you at the moment of uh, preparing your proposal. Um, Again, once more, clearly describe the individual, uh, the innovation of the individual elements that you propose, or as well the combination uh, of these uh, individual elements. And if it is a combination, what is the degree of innovation of each of them? Describe the state of the art, of, uh, which is the benchmark against which you are going to assess or the proposal will assess the innovation that you uh, produce. And uh, once more, pay attention to whether you are doing the, this comparison at EU level or at national level, because uh, the score that you may get, it is different. When it's at national level, you can get a maximum minimum threshold. When it's at EU level, you may have a higher threshold. And as Roma has said, Please also, as well, have a look at the projects that we have already ongoing because, I mean, uh, there is information on the dashboard and we want you, as well, to compare to what are the projects that we are already supporting. And then finally, uh, I would say, last but not least, uh, you need to have uh, clear and data and substantiate what you are proposing. The evaluators need to be convinced of your application. Uh, they, they have to be able to compare what you are proposing compared to the state of the art. So we need a clear uh, performance data and uh, take into account different aspects of the project like uh, plan design, operating approach, construction, performance, reliability and availability, maintenance or economics. So please have a look at all these aspects because I mean, the evaluation will be uh, done uh, in a comprehensive manner. So as, uh, as I mentioned, check Annex 1 thoroughly for this uh, degree of innovation criteria. And with this, I finish and I pass it on to Joao. Joao. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, indeed, I'll, so I'll go through the uh, let's say the, the next uh, award criteria regarding the, uh, the greenhouse gas emission uh, uh, saving criteria. So uh, indeed, it's one of the key elements that is uh, let's say uh, uh, part of the uh, of the evaluation. But beyond that, it also is quite relevant for the uh, 
So also for the, uh, let's say, for the, uh, as a KPI for the monitoring and therefore for the disbursement of the grants. So um, uh, the intention is not to give you a, a crash course on the, uh, on the greenhouse gas uh, emission avoidance methodology, but to some extent to go through the, uh, the, the main elements and uh, hopefully also help you then uh, when you, uh, let's say, when you will dive into the, into the methodology and, uh, and, um, and prepare your, uh, your application. So, um, so, there, so as mentioned, of course, it's one of the, uh, one of the selection criteria. Uh, the, uh, there is then this, uh, of course, the, the, the reference re regarding uh, the, uh, the project monitoring and the disbursement, but also for, uh, for knowledge sharing purposes, it's one of, the, uh, one of the elements that also needs to be taken into, uh, into account. So the, um, the, in, in a way to, to help you, and this was also mentioned before by, uh, by Roman, uh, in a way to, to help you and also to have a, a, a better reference for the, uh, let's say for the, uh, for basically when you prepare your application, there is a, a full tutorial that is now available. Uh, the aim with this tutorial is also to break down into different, uh, different sections and, uh, uh, and this will, let's say, will hopefully also ma make you uh, make make it easier or ma make it more uh, more user friendly to go through the uh, the different parts of the methodology. So the methodology itself is also uh, available in the um, in the uh, tender portal. But then the uh, let's say the specificities of the different uh, let's say the different elements of the methodology uh, are now in a way available in this uh, in in uh, this uh, easier or hopefully also easier way to, uh, to, um, to, to apply. So, uh, and we recommend, there is some sort of recommendation in terms of where you should start in terms of the, uh, uh, if you're new to the methodology, uh, and well, to some extent even if you're maybe uh, more experienced, uh, but it's still relevant to, to go through the uh, first, through the main principles and then dive into the, uh, maybe into the relevant, uh, the relevant elements, because as, um, uh, as you're probably aware, and well, for those who are maybe experienced, uh, uh, but there are some, in a way, some simplifications that are relevant for the uh, for the small scale. Uh, but also from one, let's say, from one exercise to the other, there may be some uh, some uh, some fine tuning within the methodology. So we we clearly recommend that you uh, that you go through this uh, this uh, let's say this tutorial, and uh, again focusing on different uh, the different elements that are relevant for. Uh, for um, for for your case. So the um, so now uh, so going through the uh, let's say the, uh, the 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 methodology in a, a step by step approach. So we have kind of this uh, let's say this uh, 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 schematics that in a way uh, aim to help you to uh, let's say to to see where to start. But, uh, and we'll go into the different elements uh, more or less one by one, but uh, clearly the first one will be well, defining the project and the, and the project boundaries, uh, classifying then your project, uh, identifying, of course, depending then on the, on the specific project, the, the appropriate methodology and the section and the specific tools that need to be used for the, uh, basically for that, uh, for, for your case. Uh, it is, in a way, of course, you can always revert back depending, and then when you go to the, uh, through the different steps, uh, for example, uh, 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 you may, let's say, when you identify then the, the project and the methodology, you may have, in a way, to, to go back and to define the, uh, and to reassess to some extent the, the, the organizational boundaries. But of course, a key element in this is to ensure consistency when, uh, when you go from one step to the other in, the, uh, in applying the, uh, the methodology. Um, so once you have this defined, of course, then you need to, to, def to identify the reference scenario. So very clearly the, the methodology, uh, the, way, the way it is developed, of course, you need, uh, you, you need a, a reference to compare to. So basically, the, uh, uh, so you have, identifying then the reference, you, can, you will then compare your, uh, your project to that, to that reference. And that, of course, will, will be the, uh, let's say, the approach or the, uh, the, uh, the outcome will be then the uh, the, um, the, um, the GHG uh, avoidance compared to that, uh, to that, um, to that reference. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, then, of course, uh, having this setup, apply your project operational data to the uh, to the calculator. So all these tools, again, it's uh, this is also available uh, in the tools. You have also examples, which uh, hopefully also uh, uh, will help in the uh, let's say in uh, basically also in apply in uh, in uh, applying the uh, the tools. Uh, and of course, this all will then need to be uploaded into the um, into the uh, the app into the application. So there are two key elements. So the absolute uh, GHG emission avoidance and the relative GHG uh, emission avoidance. Um, the, uh, so as mentioned before, the, uh, the absolute is taking into account the, so comparing the reference to the, uh, to the, project, uh, to the project scenario uh, over a total of, uh, of uh, ten, 10 years. So forecasting the emissions over, this, uh, over a 10 year, 10 year period. Uh, whereas the uh, relative GHG emission uh, avoidance, you take the uh, the absolute and you divide by the uh, by the uh, cumulative of the uh, of the reference uh, reference scenario, and it, the result is a is a percentage figure. A very important element uh, is definitely def defining the boundaries uh, of the project, and of course this is very specific to your to your own uh, to your your own case uh, but this is uh, this is a very clear or a very uh, uh, critical point in the uh, let's say in the uh, in the in the methodology and we have here in the in the slide identified some in a way some uh, some common uh, common issues that uh, that are uh, that are raised uh, or and that can lead to, to some results or some uh, some errors in the calculation, and of course, the uh, if such errors, uh, well, they can come to in well the the outcome of those errors can come in as a detriment to the uh, let's say to the to the evaluation or even to the uh, to your calculation. So uh, throughout the uh, the method methodology, we also try to uh, to make it uh, or I say to. To, to raise your attention to such uh, to such issues, so that indeed we uh, let's say uh, uh, we hope that you uh, let's say basically apply the methodology in the best way uh, possible, and therefore take into account such uh, such possible uh, such possible issues. Um, so uh, as mentioned before, the, uh, so within this uh, thir third step, so regarding the uh, the appropriate methodology, so you have three. Let's say uh, you have uh, different, uh, let's say different parts of the methodology, or let's say that apply to to different, uh, let's say uh, groupings. So we have on the energy intensive industries, where you clearly have, uh, um, let's say, methodology specific uh, uh, calculations and, and guidance. Um, also have in, on the renewable uh, electricity uh, heat and cooling uh, so uh, so including plants for manufacturing of uh, of um, components for uh, for uh, renewable uh, energy and uh, um, yeah for renewable energy uh, another element is regarding the energy storage so including plants uh, for the manufacturing of energy storage uh, components uh, as an example uh, uh, batteries uh, and so on. So you have different, uh, uh, let's say, different um, elements uh, or different guidance uh, or specific guidance for uh, for such cases. Um, also, have regarding the carbon capture and credit. So you have a sec in section three uh, some detailed guidance, and these projects should then be classified under well, under the relevant uh, either if they are linked with energy intensive industries or if they are uh, linked with uh, with uh, renewable uh, re renewable energy um, uh, sector, uh, and therefore, so once these are identified, but then you have a specific, let's say, specific uh, subsection uh, addressing uh, carbon uh, capture credits. So the uh, the methodology itself well, will then include all these different uh, elements, and you will have, for example, already uh, some default parameters that are uh, that are provided in the um, in the uh, so, in the methodology and in the tools, uh, for example, uh, uh, well, for example, ETS benchmarks are already pr uh, provided uh, provided there. But you also have emission factors that are uh, 
that are that are uh, that are provided in the in the tools and uh, in a way helping you also to uh, to apply the correct uh, the correct uh, reference um, and um, and you also have uh, additional information regarding monitoring reporting and verification uh, of the performance uh, and also uh, elements relevant for the knowledge sharing uh, um, knowledge sharing elements that also need to be taken into account so you'll see you have the uh, and this uh, as mentioned before you have this uh, calculator so an excel tool that can be used but also in that tool uh, you have examples that uh, will also help you in your uh, in your application process um, i mentioned before regarding uh, Errors or possible issues in the uh, in the uh, let's say when when uh, applying the uh, the methodology, one very important element is the uh, the serious uh, inherent uh, weakness, which of course can uh, or will have a, a significant impact in the uh, in the evaluation, and therefore this can uh, uh, well basically very strongly penalize the. Uh, the uh, your application and ultimately basically if it's classified as a significant inherent uh, weakness uh, will ultimately fail the proposal so we uh, we well we want to highlight that this is a uh, let's say uh, uh, the, let's say of course it's one of the issues that uh, we we assess during the uh, the evaluation but it's a uh, it's uh, for this reason that we also, uh, throughout the, uh, the methodology, also identify elements that uh, you need to be aware of and that uh, we ask you to, uh, to um, let's say, to follow the methodology in, uh, in the, uh, let's say, in, in the best way uh, uh, as described so that indeed we avoid as much as, or we avoid this, uh, this, po this potential uh, risk of, uh, of, such, uh, of such outcome. Because definitely it's not in the interest of uh, well of uh, of the applicant and also uh, from from our side we want to have uh, uh, the the best uh, the best projects and the best applications uh, possible. Um, one uh, one uh, also important element that uh, it's also uh, important to uh, to to highlight is the possibility of uh, hybrid projects. So clearly this is when. So when a certain uh, project will uh, will have activities from uh, let's say from more than one uh, that would be eligible for m for more than one uh, category. So uh, a combination of uh, uh, energy intensive with uh, with renewables or with energy storage. So there is this possibility that indeed you have a project that well, could ultimately fall into different categories, and therefore the uh, the um, Let's say within the methodology, this is classified as a, as a hybrid project. Uh, but the uh, the uh, very strong attention needs to be needs to be paid to the uh, let's say to the uh, basically uh, to the double counting uh, issue. So uh, there needs to be uh, the the project can be classified as a hybrid. So indeed, it can be uh, there can be this combination. But the uh, the principle of double counting or uh, in a way, ensuring that there is no double counting is uh, is very important, and therefore there needs to be so, uh, within the methodology. You have, uh, um, to some extent, uh, clear guidance and clear elements that need to be, uh, let's say, that will help you also ensuring that this double counting is uh, is avoided. And basically, uh, um, you have specific sections uh, that uh, help you on basically how to correct when uh, in a hybrid project how to correct to, meaning uh, how to correct the accounting so to ensure that there is a, this is a safeguarded so um, on the absolute uh, as uh, as indicated here so they are calculated separately using the respective sections of the methodology and then they are added up so this is uh, uh, they are added up but and then corrected for the double counting as a as a uh, as an example, and of course, the, uh, uh, here again, special attention on the possible errors. Um, yeah. So um, again, the following up, you have the uh, the reference scenario. Uh, here we have the uh, as examples of uh, for the different uh, different sectors uh, the uh, the uh, what are uh, examples of the of the reference scenarios to be taken into account. Uh, you have again. You have a, a lot more detailed uh, overview uh, in the methodology, so I'll not. I will leave it as uh, as um, 
just for, for you to consult and then, uh, and then again uh, uh, go more into detail uh, in, the, uh, in the relevant sections of the, of the methodology and the tutorial. And, the, uh, and as mentioned before, uh, you have the uh, uh, certain parameters and default values are already included in the, uh, in the, um, in the tool, so in the Excel file. Uh, again, here just as a, a snapshot of this, uh, of, this, of, this, uh, of these results or of these references, and a snapshot also of the tool itself, where basically once the project uh, data is put into the, uh, into the Excel file, there will be uh, basically a, a calculation uh, uh, that will follow the, uh, the principles of the methodology. So the parameters are, are encoded and then the calculation uh, will, uh, well, the outcome will be a calculation on the, uh, on the um, basically the, uh, again, the GHG, uh, the absolute and the relative uh, uh, factors. And yeah, uh, an important element to, to highlight is that indeed there there are some. Uh, so whenever some some uh, some sec or some applicant specific assumptions are uh, are used, there there needs to be uh, first transparent documentation and uh, and, re and relevant uh, relevant uh, and supporting uh, uh, references uh, should be uh, should be added. Uh, and uh, because this is relevant when assessing the credibility of the calculations and, uh, uh, and therefore uh, it shouldn't be taken as granted that, uh, let's say, that this is, or cer certain assumptions are common, uh, are to some extent uh, common knowledge, uh, you need to have to provide the, uh, let's say, the uh, rel uh, relevant reference and supporting, uh, supporting evidence of, the, uh, of uh, any sp uh, sp specific uh, assumptions. Um, yeah, here, well, uh, again, I will skip through this. Uh, I think this, uh, again, uh, maybe again to highlight the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, ah, to some extent, uh, a checklist that is part of the methodology that will also uh, help you, uh, help you uh, in, the, uh, in the application. Uh, so uh, we welcome you to use all the, uh, all the elements or all the uh, guidance uh, that, the, that is provided in the methodology because this has been uh, basically a, uh, a very uh, robust exercise and with the intention indeed to, to help you and to, uh, let's say, to, uh, to, uh, to support in, the, uh, in preparing the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, let's say, the application for this, for this element which uh, we are aware that it's uh, in a way uh, um, can cause quite some uh, quite some uh, uh, questions uh, from uh, from applicants uh, in view of it to some extent in in some cases being a relatively uh, uh, novel element in a, in a, in an application process. So uh, there is quite uh, in a way a checklist for self assessment of the uh, let's say uh, of your application uh, and um, and we welcome you also to go through go through this uh, this element uh, within the um, within the uh, the uh, the application or in the assessment, there is uh, there are some bonus points uh, for uh, for net carbon removals and for other GHG savings. Um, this again is uh, well, this is part of the uh, of the assessment, and uh, again we uh, it's a uh, it's a new element, and we welcome you also to uh, to take that into account in the uh, in uh, when. Uh, when preparing your uh, your application, if these uh, are relevant uh, to your to your specific case, also to, to take that into uh, into account. And as a, as a final remark, just again to reiterate the point regarding the significant in, inherent uh, weakness, which automatically fails a proposal. So therefore, uh, uh, we ask you to pay very close attention to the let's say to the uh, to your application and to the uh, to basically. Uh, um, Go through the uh, apl apply the methodology correctly. So indeed, to uh, to ensure this is not uh, this is not uh, the case, uh, and we know that uh, yeah, there are well, questions will come up during the uh, during the preparation of the uh, of the application, uh, and we welcome you to uh, to put those questions into the help desk. Uh, we will we, but by doing that, we will also uh, ask you to be very specific on the. Uh, 
on the uh, on on the question and because uh, the help desk is there indeed to 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 support in preparing your uh, or to support in uh, in clarifying the method the methodology uh, and the um, uh, so uh, we help we welcome you to use it but the, of course the final responsibility lies with the uh, with the applicant so um, yeah I think with that I will uh, I will end from from my side thank you. Thank you very much, Maria and Joao, for uh, detailed presentations. I hope this was useful and uh, clear uh, to, um, to participants. Um, now, I think we, we should move with a couple of questions uh, that we have received. So, on the degree of innovation, I see a question for Maria. Is it allowed to compare the innovation both on national and EU level? Uh, well, I would say you choose in your project what you want to do. I mean, if you decide to focus on the national level and it's your uh, comparison for the state of the art, then you don't need to compare at EU level. In fact, the cold text says that if your innovation at the national level, then the geographical reference of the state of the art must be the country where the project will be implemented. And you should demonstrate how do you go beyond uh, with your solution beyond what already is, exists at national level uh, therefore you choose with the consequences or the potential consequences as i've highlighted before on the mark uh, that you can have which can be just the minimum threshold or you may have uh, a higher score depending on the choice that you make thank you uh, next question, if we can have them. Okay. Are the materials for the construction of the plant and the components to be included as inputs? I guess this is on the greenhouse gas emissions uh, calculation methodology, or just the inputs that will be used during the production? Joao, maybe you could look at this. Um, yeah. So, uh, so the the construction, uh, so materials for the construction of the plant uh, are not part of the um, of the uh, of the methodology, or of the calculation. Uh, so we make reference to the uh, let's say emissions from uh, from capital goods. So therefore, including the uh, the machinery and uh, all this uh, all these elements should not be uh, should be should not be part of it. Um, but then, indeed, the uh, let's say. Uh, the uh, the inputs relevant to the uh, to the project those will then be part of the uh, of the uh, of the methodology so of the calculation okay thank you uh, now on the hybrid project greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. are we supposed to upload two separate files for hybrid projects yeah so the uh, so as mentioned before so with the hybrid projects you have let's say you you will make you will use the uh, the let's say the relevant sections of the methodology for the uh, for example if you have uh, if you cover two different uh, for example energy intensive and uh, energy storage as an example you would you would have to uh, to use the uh, let's say both both calculators but then ensure that the uh, this uh, let's say the uh, the the double counting is uh, is not um, let's say uh, well uh, is corrected. Um, but uh, but you will indeed have to use these two elements of the uh, of the uh, of the calculation uh, of the methodology. So for the different parts of the uh, of the hybrid uh, project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Just uh, but in the end, it's one file that is uploaded. So you have this. Uh, let's say you kind of construct your own. Uh, so you use these two references and you build one single file, which is then uploaded. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. I hope this was clear. Uh, again, in the greenhouse gas emissions, electricity consumed by a project, do you confirm that emission factor is zero, uh, regardless of the source of electricity? I guess this relates to electricity consumed. Uh, yes, so um, so, in the, so you have, in, in the methodology, you have, to uh, some extent, uh, well, a specific section that has the emission factors uh, to be uh, for electricity that are to be uh, to be used in the different uh, in the specific cases, but uh, clearly for the uh, for the uh, uh, grid electricity, 
the uh, let's say the uh, the 2050 uh, grid emission factor is the one to be used. So yes, the the zero uh, the zero emission factor is the um, is the, um, the the relevant one to be to be used in this case. Okay, thank you. And on the GHG emissions calculation, could we use as a reference emissions the initial data for the calculations of the estimated ETS of 2021? This relates to emission factors that apply and uh, which which year? For so, uh, if uh, well, I, I understand this is also linked with the uh, with the ETS benchmarks. Uh, so the uh, uh, so the ETS benchmarks they have been defined for the period twenty twenty one to twenty twenty five. So the uh, and those are the ones that are clearly in the uh, in the um, in the uh, methodology. So in the in the tool, and those are the ones that are to be to be used. Uh, clearly, because well, the uh, the next exercise is still to be uh, to be done, and uh, and uh, yeah, we don't know it. Uh, of course, the the outcome. So yes, it's the the values that are, in a way, now in the uh, in the direct or in the uh, in the benchmarking decision, and also in the uh, in the tool itself. Yeah. yeah. So use the the values that are also encoded in the tool. That's a, a clear answer. Um, now, for the manufacturing of new batteries, which would be the reference scenario to use to compare our small-scale battery manufacturing plant? So, which reference scenario to use when it comes to manufacturing of batteries? Uh, yeah. So, for the um, so, if I'm not mistaken, um, oh, but this can yeah, uh, I think we can maybe come back to it. But if I'm not mistaken, there. Is, uh, so we have a specific section in the um, in the uh, in the methodology uh, for energy storage uh, of components, uh, and uh, within there there will be the uh, basically the uh, the uh, the relevant let's say the rel relevant reference to be used for the uh, for uh, for the reference scenario uh, for for this case. So it's um, yeah. Maybe just to highlight, it is always uh, case specific because it very much depends on the use cases for the batteries. So what is it that you replace uh, is the key question and therefore uh, difficult to give a definite answer. It is more described in the methodology dependent on your particular case of the project. Okay, I see no more questions. So I suggest that uh, if uh, we all agree, we could take a bit of a break. Uh, and we come back uh, at what time? In 10 minutes. OK, so let's see each other again, 11.42. And we will go ahead with our presentations uh, on the other award criteria. OK, see you soon. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back. Uh, welcome back after a short break, uh, during which I hope you had some uh, time to look, but we were circulating the projects from the previous small-scale call, uh, just for your inspiration and information. Uh, this will also be published on the website so that you can see what type of projects were succeeding in the previous call. I'll give you a bit more picture about uh, the Innovation Fund and the type of projects we can finance. So now we move to the uh, to the next uh, session and um, we will focus on additional criteria uh, for selection. We will first look into project maturity um, from technical, financial and operational perspective. Then we will look at scalability and finally at cost efficiency. And I'm very happy to have three colleagues with me. Uh, first, uh, project maturity will be um, presented by uh, Gianluca Tondi, who is the head of sector in the Innovation Fund unit, and uh, Kentan Nerinks, who is the uh, senior financial engineering manager at our financial engineering team at CINEA. And uh, then we move to scalability that will be presented by Maria, and back to Kentan for cost efficiency. So Gianluca, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Roman. Good morning, everybody. So I will present uh, the first sub-criterion of, uh, of the project maturity. This is technical maturity. And uh, here, of course, the, this sub-criterion relates to the, um, to the maturity of the proposed uh, project from the technical point of view. In particular, uh, applicants should reply to, to key questions under this, uh, this sub-criterion. The first one is on the technical feasibility of the proposed solution to deliver the expected output and ultimately the, the estimated, the expected greenhouse gas emissions savings. And the second point is on the, on the applicant should demonstrate a solid understanding of uh, risks, the technology risks, and also of uh, the proposed mitigation measures. Um, for this sub-criterion, uh, the relevant sections are in the proposal, in the proposal documents are, of course, the application form, in particular, the application form part B, the section is section 3.1, where there are uh, all the um, technical maturity, but also for the part related to the risks, uh, section 3.4 on risk management. And then other parts, relevant parts for this sub-criteria are also the initial part of the application form, the one uh, where, where you have to describe the technical characteristics uh, of your project, the scope, uh, the scope of the project and of the, of the proposed technology. Another relevant document is the feasibility study. I remind you that this is a mandatory annex. And uh, also uh, another optional document, but it's a document that you can, you can use, you can uh, submit in order to say demonstrate the, the maturity of, uh, of the, your technology is, uh, is uh, to an existing uh, uh, technical due diligence uh, report. And if you use this document, for instance, uh, I think it's, it's good to, to make references to these documents, to visibility study, to technical due diligence reports in the, in the relevant section of Part B. So also to help experts to, to find references uh, to the, your, in your parts of the proposal. So this is the first question. As I said before, it is the technical feasibility to deliver the expected output uh, and then again in turn the greenhouse gas uh, emissions savings. Um, here uh, you should explain the degree of the of technology readiness uh, of the proposed solution and the technical feasibility of, uh, again, of your project to deliver the expected output, uh, for instance, in terms of volumes of, of the products. And this also in terms, of course, ultimately to achieve the greenhouse gas emission savings uh, that you, you claim uh, in, your, in, in the proposal itself. Um, in order to, to prove this, the, the readiness of your solution, uh, we ask you to follow the guidance provided in the application form, again, section 3.1. There are a number of questions that we ask you to reply, the, again, to, uh, to, to, to demonstrate, to, to show the, the, the maturity of your project from this point uh, of view. For instance, there are the following questions. 
you should uh, reply to whether the proposed technology has already been proven in a pilot scale demonstration. This, of course, will ensure the confidence and the, on, the, on the fact that you will be able to, to deliver what is expected. Uh, the characteristics, you should describe the characteristics of the proposed plant. Uh, if they should be credible, should be realistic, uh, and they should be, of course, based on, uh, should be in line with basic uh, engineering principles. Uh, also, you should describe clearly and uh, the assumption that you use for the operational characteristics of the plant, and uh, again, uh, at the end for the for the for the calculate for the. Um, estimation of expected outputs and of the greenhouse gas uh, emission savings. These uh, assumptions should be clearly described, should be accurate, uh, at the same time also should be conservative enough in order to not to have uh, uh, overestimations or underestimation of the outputs and of the greenhouse gas emissions avoidance. Uh, you should also put uh, clear references to the feasibility study and other supporting documents, as I said before, in, the, in this part, uh, in the section 3.1 of the, of the application form. Then the second point under technical maturity is on the, on the risks. Uh, so here you should focus on the key technological risks uh, of the risk that are, I mean, they could hamper, let's say, the, the, the feasibility of, uh, your, your propose, of the proposed solution. Um, you should describe the key risks uh, for your technology uh, and then also for these risks uh, also define, identify the mitigation measures uh, that you think are suitable and uh, you should describe clearly these mitigation measures uh, and also explain why you think they are, they are appropriate. This part uh, is, uh, should be done in section 3.4 of the application form where there is a section on technical risk, specific section just on technical risk and then the risk identified should also be summarized in the in the table that we provide in the application form on the on the critical risk in this case for the technical risk so you should summarize them and also include information like the impact of this risk and also the likelihood of uh, of uh, of this uh, of identified risk and always also uh, please uh, substantiate your ana risk analysis uh, with the uh, uh, with information also providing feasibility study, in particular with the uh, risk hit uh, maps. Then uh, on the feasibility study, uh, feasibility study, we don't, this is, uh, as I said before, this is mandatory annex. However, we don't have uh, a template that, uh, so we, you are free to use uh, uh, documents that uh, you think are relevant, of course, for, for, to explain to, for, the, for this aspect of the project, for the technical maturity. Uh, however, we ask you also to, to, to follow the guidance, uh, the indication, the minimum content that uh, is mentioned in the call text, in section five of the call text, uh, so to cover at least the points that uh, they are mentioned here, like for instance, a project uh, description, uh, uh, location analysis, an overview of the key aspects uh, of, the, of the site, uh, like uh, site, uh, stakeholder involvement, uh, acceptance and so on. Then of course technical maturity assessment is somehow mirrors what I already said before on the application form, so on technology readiness, uh, feasibility of achieving the outputs. Then also um, uh, an analysis of the possible socioeconomic benefits uh, but also of the environmental impacts and proposed mitigation measures. Uh, and it's of course, an analysis of the feasibility from the technical economic point of view. And finally, as I said before, risks uh, and mitigation measures, including a heat map. So this was my last slide for on the technical maturity. I pass the floor now to, to Kentan for the part on financial maturity. Thank you very much. Hello, I am Kentan Jerings. I will present you the financial maturity part. This part is quite important because from our experience, we see that at least 40% of the application are failing these criteria. So please, I advise you to really listen to the guidance and to follow the guidance and tutorials mentioned in the different websites uh, earlier and later in this presentation. The financial maturity has as main objective to assess if your project is able to reach financial close within four years. And financial close, pay attention, is not just the final investment decision. 
According to the uh, Innovation Fund regulation, financial close is the moment where you have all your contracts, financing contract and technical contract signed with all conditions in them met. So it's just not FID, it's much more bold than that. It means that for financial close, we, you will have to prove that you have your permits, that you have your uh, construction contracts, that you have your supplier's contract, and that you have your offtake contract, and eventually uh, debt uh, lending agreement. And all conditions in this contract have to be met. So please con consider this definition when you are preparing your project and where, where, when you are defining the planning of your project and your work packages. For financial maturity, we will discuss about four main aspects, uh, business plan and profitability, soundness of financing plan, commitment of project funders, and risks. The financial maturity could be found in the application in the part 3.2, 3.4, and 6. You have to add, in order to assess the financial maturity, several mandatory annexes. You must add a business plan. This business plan must also include the financial statement of the project shareholders for the, ne for the last three years. This is important because it will help us to allow to ensure that you have the fundings needed to finance the project. Furthermore, you have to provide us and to fill in a template, the financial information file. This financial information file is also called in the funding and tenders portal, relevant cost calculator slash detailed budget table. These is, are the same files. We just call this file FIF because it's easier. And finally, you have also to provide us uh, your detailed uh, financial model and any existing due diligence. Over the business model and business plan, what is important here is to uh, be able to provide us a credible business plan. You have to detail in which market you are in, what's the market condition, what are the market uh, gap you want to address. You also have to detail very precisely what are your capex, opex, and revenues. As we want to assess the maturity of your project, it's quite obvious that if you are, for instance, providing us one line for the capex mentioning, okay, my capex will be on average this amount and I take 30% contingencies. Obviously, this kind of description is will be considered as less mature than a project which is able to define very precisely each topics which are comprised in the capex. So what we want you to do is really to take the evaluators of your proposal by the end and explain them how your assumptions are constructed. What are the basis of your assumptions? It's not just enough to say, I take this revenues because in my experience that's that. No, please explain the evaluators why you are taking these revenues, on which basis are your assumption uh, constructed. It is really important to assess your maturity level. Furthermore, on the offtake contracts, we do not expect that these contracts are signed at the moment at the submission, but at least you should provide us, provide us an explanation or on your intent to be able to find these offtake contracts. What's your strategy to secure them? And finally, the contingencies that you have, will take have to be aligned with the market practice and explain this also. The financial model you have to provide. So the financial model you will have to provide will be available in the FIF, but also in the, your own detailed financial model that you will have also to provide. The financial model will show the per business to your cash flow projection. We want to be sure, and you have to really ensure that it, these projections are, are coherent with your financial model, with your financing plan, and with the FIF. So coherency between your assumptions, coherency between all the models is really important. Another aspect, and this one is a bit different from the last time, we want you to uh, calculate a project-specific work according to the Innovation Fund relevant cost methodology. This document is, av is available in the funding and tenders portal under the name uh, Methodology for Calculation of Relevant Costs. So you have to calculate the WAC really 
precisely and according this specific guidance. We are, you, are, you, you should not use your own corporate WAC. We are doing that to ensure equality of treatment between all applicants. The WAC will reflect the project risks. Secondly, on the financing plan. For the financing plan, we want to know how you will source your main fundings. You have to justify them. You have also to ensure that your financing plan cover eventually negative cash flows. And you have to prove us that the debt you intend to take to sign is credible and aligned with your project profitability. So you have to be sure that the disbursement also of the grant are aligned with the Coltex rules. It's also really important. Uh, yes, I, the commitment of the project funders here. What we want to know and to see is the level of progress of your negotiation on the funding that you will have to provide. You have to define the amount and who will provide this amount and the steps requires to have the final approval of this investment. If you have letter of support, please be aware that we will also look at the level of signature of these letters. As a letter of support signed by a board member will have more weight than, a, than a letters signed by the project developers, for instance. Another aspect is that if your project has negative cash flows, if your project is not profitable, in this case, in order to ensure that this project will be developed, we'll need a real strong commitment letters from the shareholders. These commitment letters must very precisely mention that the shareholders are aware that the project are, is unprofitable, but that they will invest in it nevertheless. If you have uh, funding from the member states in the form of grant, you have to also to explain uh, the, the nature of this funding, the steps uh, to get the definitive approval, and the visibility uh, of this funding. Describe the, all the milestones up to reach final cell close. On the risk part, this part is also very important, and often it's a bit underestimated. But in financial maturity, risks are really important because if you have a major risk which is not mitigated, should this risk happen, it will endanger the project. And so it will endanger the credibility of your project. So it is really important for you to define all the major risks of your project and to propose credible mitigation measures for them. When we speak about risk, we also speak about projects from which you are dependent. If you depend on the completion of a project which is not in the scope of your project, this is a risk, and you have to explain it. Finally, I spoke a bit, uh, and we detail here a bit, the main mandatory document. So the business plan is a mandatory annex, and we detail here the different part that a business plan should traditionally contain. We, and don't forget that uh, you have to provide the business plan, but you have also to provide the financial information file, your own detailed financial models, the profit and loss account balance sheet for the last three years, and other annex as due diligence for instances. Voila, that was all for the financial maturity part. Thanks, Quentin. So I continue with the third sub-criterion, that is the operational maturity. And here, this sub-criterion relates to the, to the capacity of the proposed project to, 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 to be deployed successfully during, the, during, its, during its implementation. And there are five different aspects that are to be addressed in this, uh, uh, under this sub-criterion. Uh, the first one is project implementation plan, including deliverables and milestones. The second one is on permits, rights, uh, licenses, uh, and the regulatory procedures. The third one is on the, the public acceptance of the project. 
Uh, then uh, on the project management team and the project organization. And the last one, similarly to, to technical and financial maturity, is on the operational risks uh, and the proposed uh, mitigation measures. For this uh, sub-criterion, uh, the relevant parts of the application form are 3.3, uh, that is, again, is the part on the operational maturity. 3.4 is the on the risks. And uh, then 3.3 on the project diagram, the project diagram with the, with the, the indication of the, the stakeholders involved uh, and also the relationships within it, these uh, actors involved. Then uh, there is section six uh, on work plan, uh, work packages, tasks, uh, and, uh, and the timing. Then uh, uh, we ask also applicants to provide uh, a timetable, a Gantt chart of the of the innovation fund project, uh, and this should be based on the on the on the template that is available in the funding and tender portal. Also, another another document uh, related to the project management team is uh, the participant information document with the CV of key staff and of. Uh, with the track record, uh, track record of previous projects, for instance, that uh, are relevant, of course, for the innovation fund projects, and also in this case, any existing due diligence report, if, if available. But this is an optional document. So the first one is uh, on the operational maturity. Also for this, uh, as usual, for this, please follow the guidance provided uh, in the application form section 3.3. Here, applicants should describe the proposed planning to, for the implementation uh, of the project. So they should also include, uh, they should indicate uh, the key dates, the milestones uh, that are, are necessary for the implementation of the project. Uh, as written in the application form, and as already mentioned this morning, there should be uh, at least the financial close, uh, the entry into operation of the, of the project, uh, and then also after the entry into operation, the annual reporting. For this, this is the guidance is provided in the call text uh, and the application form with, uh, with the tables, with, uh, with, uh, with the sections to be filled in. Also, it's important to provide a timeline of the, of the project uh, uh, until the end of the project, until the, the end of the three years of operation uh, that was mentioned this morning. And also, please always uh, make sure that there is consistency between the information provided uh, in the timeline in the, in the application form and also other documents uh, and the timetable, uh, the Gantt chart. Um, key aspects to be covered under this uh, sub-criterion are that uh, you also should uh, uh, provide a clear strategy on how to reach all the milestones, uh, including, of course, financial close and entry into operation. Uh, and also, you should clearly describe the timing of the planning activities. They should be realistic and should be consistent uh, with, uh, with the overall let's say, the project duration and, uh, and in particular for the plant construction. And uh, this planning, as I said before, should be consistent with the, also the description of the work packages, milestones, and deliverables that are described in section, in section 6 of the application form. The second point is on the, on the uh, you should provide an analysis of uh, the required permits, for instance, environmental permits, uh, IPR issues, uh, licenses, uh, and other regulatory procedures that are relevant for, for the successful implementation of uh, your project. So this is something that uh, should, be, this should be covered in this section. So we ask you to have a detailed, na clear analysis of the regulatory framework, uh, any intellectual property rights that are related, that are relevant for your project, for your, for, uh, your proposed solution, uh, and also other relevant regulatory procedures that could have an impact uh, on, the, on the implementation uh, of the project. In particular, also please put uh, information on the relevant permitting processes, uh, and uh, as I said before, including permits related to environmental aspects. So, you should also describe what is the status of these permits, uh, for instance, uh, if they have been already obtained or not. If not, uh, also you should uh, describe the planning, uh, the plan, the strategy, and the timing uh, that you think you will, you will obtain uh, these, uh, these, uh, these permits. For instance, uh, like expected reception dates uh, and measures planned to ensure the timely granting of, uh, of these permits. 
The third point, the third aspect under this, uh, this sub-criterion is uh, related to the, to the public acceptance. Uh, so you should uh, demonstrate that, there is, uh, that uh, you have a, a sound strategy to, to achieve, to ensure the public acceptance of your, of your project. So please provide a detailed description of all environmental, possible environmental impacts uh, expected throughout the whole life cycle of the, of the project, so from construction to the commissioning of the project itself, and also uh, describe the associate, associated mitigation measures. Uh, you should describe the degree of public acceptance of the technology of the project you, you, you propose, and also uh, present a clear uh, and specific strategy on how, to, on how this public acceptance will be ensured during project uh, implementation. And please do not, uh, please, please be specific uh, to, to, to the, your project, uh, to the project that you are presenting that don't, uh, don't provide only generic explanation on the issue. Uh, the fourth aspect is on the, on the project management team and the project organization. So here the first thing is that uh, uh, you should uh, prove that uh, in the consortium you propose uh, has the necessary skills and competencies to, to implement the project, uh, to uh, develop and implement the project itself. So you should provide uh, information on the key staff, uh, their key qualifications, uh, track record of, this, uh, of the key staff involved. Uh, of course, you should demonstrate sufficient coverage uh, from the technical, financial, operational point of view to, to develop the project itself. If you think you will need some additional uh, resources uh, from outside, also you need to justify why this is, uh, this is needed. For the project organization, we ask uh, project management structure, governance, responsibility, description of the responsibility, decision-making mechanisms, and uh, also all the processes, all these processes within the consortium. And also, as I said before, for this also there is a section, section 3.3, uh, section 3.4, sorry, where you can <coughs> provide information uh, on the project diagram with uh, all the relevant stakeholders and actors involved uh, in, the, in the project itself. The last point is, uh, uh, the last aspect that could be covered is uh, again on risk. Uh, so here you should describe all the uh, key risks that could, uh, could have an impact on the implementation of, uh, of your project. So this could be related, for instance, to, to the construction, to the project design, to operation of the, of, the project, uh, of the project itself. And then for each identified risk, also you should propose convincing mitigation measures, measures to, to mitigate the, these risks and explain again why you think these are suitable to, 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 to minimize the possible risks. This should be done in the section uh, of the operational risks. And also, as uh, done for the technical financial risk, you also summarize the identified risks and include information like uh, impact and likelihood in the section 3.4 of, uh, of the application form. Then the last point, on the, it's uh, on the bonus point. As uh, Joao already mentioned, two bonus points related to the net carbon removals and other greenhouse gas savings. There is a third bonus points related to projects that uh, are expected to use a significant amount uh, uh, of electricity. These projects are encouraged to prove, to, to provide, to demonstrate that this energy, this additional uh, energy pro comes from uh, uh, renewable energy sources. This can be done, for instance, uh, through PPPA, PPA or through, for instance, the realization of uh, your own uh, renewable energy in installations. So this is in the application form. There is a section that you, in case it is relevant for your project, uh, you are encouraged again to demonstrate that this uh, uh, additional, this electricity comes from additional electricity or renewable origin. And uh, if this is, of course, uh, if this amount is uh, significant and this uh, is uh, well substantiated in the proposal, this can, uh, can uh, uh, thanks to this, you can obtain additional points uh, in this specific uh, section. Yeah, I think this was last slide on the project maturity, so I pass the floor to, to Maria for scalability. 
Thank you, Gianluca. So we are getting almost uh, to the end of this award criteria, and I'm going to talk to you on scalability. Here, what we want to assess is the potential for scaling up the technology that you are presenting, as well as the knowledge sharing of this technology that you are proposing. So as um, Roma mentioned before, this is a criteria that has been revamped. Therefore, those of you who have uh, eventually uh, presented a proposal for an earlier call, I mean, you will see that some things are different. We are looking to scalability into uh, different uh, streams, if you want, in terms of efficiency gains and in terms of the deployment of the technology or the solutions that you propose, and as I said, as well, to the quality and the extent of the knowledge sharing. So let's look a bit in depth into this specific or different aspect. So scalability and efficiency gains uh, means that uh, we want to see uh, the cost reductions that can be expected with the technology that you are proposing in, uh, in your project. Uh, you should as well uh, show an efficiency use of resources or alternatively how you are going to address the constraints of uh, those uh, resources um, which should have a better use, a more efficient use. In particular, when we speak about critical raw materials, biomass or resources that are scarce and looking at aspects as well, like circularity, recycling, and recyclability of these uh, scarce resources. If we switch to the scalability in terms of the deployment of technology or solutions, here uh, you should present uh, the potential uh, transfer from your project site to other sites this potential transfer at sector level, at regional, uh, at the EU level or globally, at worldwide. Uh, potential for uh, transferring this technology to other sectors beyond the one uh, in which uh, this is being used eventually at the moment, as well as possibilities of establishing new value chains or reinforcing those that exist already in Europe. So if we look at the next slide, here we have a bit the questions which are behind the slide that I presented before. So you have to show uh, yeah, which are the expected additional emission avoidance that we can expect, what is the impact that this will have in growth to your proposal and jobs, the potential, as I said, to create new value chains or reinforcing the new ones. We have here this morning uh, when we had the, the, the set of the policy, uh, how Europe is putting a lot of emphasis on developing a strategic autonomy in industrial supply chains. So it's important as well to highlight this. Uh, is there an impact on competitiveness coming out of your project? And then, uh, Another important aspect for those projects who are very much dependent on subsidies is to show the potential that they have to become cost competitive and financially viable over the time when these subsidies will not be there anymore. And then finally, uh, if we look at the quality and the extent of the knowledge sharing, uh, it is important that we really uh, have a good understanding of what we aim here. So then the goals of knowledge sharing, which is, as we have here as well this morning, a pillar of the innovation fund, is de-risking innovative low carbon technologies uh, regarding the wide scale commercialization, because this is what we want in a certain moment, going beyond your project, these technologies coming into the market, as well accelerating deployment, increasing the undertaking and the confidence in these technologies by a wider public beyond what you are proposing at the moment, and uh, maintenance of a competitive market after the demonstration uh, of the deployment of these technologies uh, that will happen within your project. Important to consider is that you look at the application form Part B, Section 4, and there, you will see that you have to outline the plan of the activities that you are proposing for knowledge sharing. 
the objectives, the key messages, the target audiences, the communication channels, social media plan, relevant monitoring indicators. And you have as well to describe the communication and the dissemination activities that you have planned, that you're planning to promote the result, the activities of your projects, as well as to maximize the impact. And another annex, uh, this of the call that is important to read in order to uh, well prepare uh, this part of your proposal is Annex 2, which is uh, devoted to knowledge sharing. So I think with this, I finish this. And I pass it on again to Kanta. On the cost efficiency. So cost efficiency is a criteria which is calculated automatically. What is the cost efficiency? Is the requested innovation fund grant you have, and that's important, you have to add to this requested innovation grant all the grant from member states or from other European program to it. So actually the numerator of the cost efficiency is innovation grant plus any other project specific grants. And you divide that by the absolute greenhouse gas emission avoidance calculated in your greenhouse gas application. In cost efficiency, we will also assess the quality of your calculation. So if uh, the, the expert identified a, a problems of lack of credibility in, in your capex, for instance, or if you integrated uh, part of the capex with, which are not eligible uh, in the, under the rules of the innovation fund, this could be addressed in uh, cost efficiency as quality of calculation, uh, because, for instance, uh, financing costs are not eligible for capex according to the innovation fund regulation. Uh, marketing costs are not eligible, etc., etc. Uh, voilà. We have, we have here a list of several costs which are excluded. Uh, so, please pay attention to this specific aspect. And that's it for the cost efficiency. Uh, the cost efficiency is calculated automatically in the financial information file which is equivalent to the uh, detailed budget tab table slash relevant cost calculator, as mentioned, mentioned previously. OK, thank you for these detailed presentations. Uh, we have looked into three criteria, project maturity, uh, maybe a couple of underlying messages. On the technical side, what is important that uh, your technology will be at the point of entry into operation ready to deliver uh, the output that you are planning to provide. Otherwise, you will not be able to achieve your greenhouse gas emissions avoidance and we will not be able to pay you. So that is the underlying principle on the financial maturity. Uh, imagine that you are submitting your, pro your proposal to a financial, to, to a commercial financier. So in essence, we are asking very similar structure of information than you would be giving to your CEO or to a bank when asking for a loan. Nevertheless, obviously, we have uh, more time to reach financial close and how detailed, how precise your calculations uh, and estimates are will also depend uh, on your distance to, to that point of the financial close. On the operational maturity, again, it is very much the question of uh, how realistic you are when uh, drawing the implementation planning for the project. Do you estimate enough time for your um, connection to the grid, uh, for the permits that you need to achieve? We have seen many projects that um, will, have, uh, will have been um, um, amended because those timing were simply too short. So, you know, it's not a beauty context. Uh, contest we really want uh, you to be real, be you know, on the ground, rather on the conservative side when proposing your project, because this will also protect uh, you from the potential negative assessment by the experts who may deem that uh, some of the timelines that you are drawing in your application uh, simply do not, uh, do not match the reality. So please take this into account. We are really trying to look at the project in a holistic way as, as one from all those uh, criteria that were just presented. Um, and most of all, be, be realistic, be well-grounded, uh, do not uh, uh, try to you know, come with the, with the things which are simply not, not realistic and cannot be achieved, because very likely the experts will, will find those. 
Then we had the, the scalability, again, rather the question of uh, how would the impact of your project be if it will be scaled further beyond the current boundary of your application, and on the cost efficiency, some hints from Kentan about how to uh, calculate that, uh, uh, and again, there is um, uh, a relevant cost calculator, we call it financial information file, which contains everything in one file, and there is a tutorial available for you on the website, so have a good look uh, to that. Okay, let's move to questions uh, that we received, uh, and let's start with the first one. Is it mandatory to reach a commercial solution by the end of the project or have a demo pilot within the project? Gianluca. Thanks, Roman. So I think, uh, I, as we said this morning, that, that uh, as presented this morning by, by Roman, also by Alexander, we, we aim to find uh, uh, first of kind commercial, commercial projects. So this means that uh, at the end of the construction, after the construction of the project, uh, so uh, after the end into operation, we expect to have a fully functioning project that is able to, to, to deliver the expected greenhouse gas uh, uh, emission savings. So I think this is the the, the important aspect uh, where on which you should focus on in the in the in the, in the proposal. So the, the that is really f fully functional and that will be able to deliver what is expected. Okay. The next, uh, what is the level of maturity that needs to be reached to apply uh, to the proposal to be reached? Yeah by the proposal, I think, to apply. Yeah. That was I, I think question. this is linked question. I mean, it's, uh, there is no, oh, sorry. Thank you. So there is no, let's say, target. There is no level of maturity that is compulsory to, to be reached. What we, you need to, to, to prove that uh, the, your, the, pr the proposed project is ready, is uh, technically this matter to, 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 to be functional after the entry into operation and to deliver the expected greenhouse gas uh, emission savings. So this is the key aspects. I mean, we don't have uh, any target in terms of technology readiness level of expected level of maturity. The important thing is, again, that uh, you will be able to deliver the, the expected, the claimed greenhouse gas emission savings after entry into operation. Because also, as Roman said, the payments will be based on the on these on these achievements. Okay, is a project where the feed study is already done and an investment decision is made before the current call closes eligible for innovation? I think this would be for Kintan. Yes, here I refer to the definition of uh, financial close. So, for uh, innovation fund, financial close is not just the final investment decision. It's also the moment where all the contracts are signed and where all the conditions are met. So it means that. First of all, it's not because you have an investment decision that you have a financial close according to the innovation fund. And furthermore, the costs uh, linked for, to the project are eligible provided that they are made after the submission date. So it means that your project is indeed eligible, but the cost linked to the feed study and to all the preparatory work which have been done before the submission date uh, are not eligible and could not be mentioned uh, as capex in for relevant cost calculation. So only the cost incurred after the submission are eligible. A very, very important uh, hint, uh, Kentan. This is all in the call text, but yes, to be to be hundred percent sure, you can ask for covering your cost retrospectively. But the earliest point when you can actually. Um, uh, claim those costs in your relevant cost calculation is the date when you the, is the w first day of a month following your submission of your project to the innovation fund so again read carefully the call text uh, it's all there um, how can we argue the need for innovation fund support in projects that have already reached final investment decision the, the question is a bit linked for the small scale coal uh, it's mentioned, it's defined by the relevant cost. So relevant cost for small-scale coal is capex. Uh, so uh, it's a bit different from the large-scale coal where we look the, the additional cost. Here it's only capex. So you could always ask for the need for the innovation fund support, even if you have reached financial, final investment decision. Uh, now you have to, to, manage, to prove that uh, 
you have a, a credible and viable business model for financial maturity, as mentioned. Okay, how can we show the project support? Does pre-existing monetary support need to be demonstrated or it's mostly other forms of positive signaling? Yes, hello. for all which is, um, all, all elements that needs to be substantiated, it's up to you. You are free to provide us evidence of support. You are free to provide us commitment of support. All these elements will be assessed during the evaluation. It is true that if you are able to provide, to provide us already commitment letters, if you are already to provide us already uh, signed uh, confirmation that you have got the funding, the project will be considered as more mature than if you have only very vague or very generic support letters. So, but it's up to you. Uh, Financial maturity is one of the evaluation criteria. It's not the only one. You are free to provide us the evidence, or not to provide us the evidence, but indeed a project providing less evidence will score less in financial maturity than a project which will uh, bring more evidence for sure. Yeah, so it's in essence also the question of distance to the date of planned financial close. Yes. The more closer you are, obviously you would have a better picture of how you will finance your project, hence you would have much more robust evidence available. If this is in three years' time, four years' time, what we essentially need to see, at least the, the proof that uh, uh, there is a prospect to get the financing that you expect to get. Okay. Is the Innovation Fund inconsistent with other public financial support at the national or European level? Is it possible to combine them? I can answer this. Yes, it is possible, uh, since we are only covering up to 60% of your relevant costs. So uh, you can come in with additional public support. And again, Kentan explained in his slides how this needs to be reflected in the cost efficiency calculation. OK. Next slide. At the application phase, should we demonstrate support by member states or third parties? I think it comes quite back to what uh, Kentan has said. Um, uh, it depends. If you will depend on support by the member state financing, for instance, so in other words, if you would expect that additional financing would come from state aid provisions, then a letter of support from that particular member state authority obviously is an important part of your application because it proves that your claim is founded, it is based on something real. If you don't expect any support uh, from state aid financing, then obviously such letter is not needed. Uh, nevertheless, uh, if you, for instance, expect uh, that your project needs to be connected to certain uh, infrastructure, then probably a, a letter of support from authority that uh, uh, manages um, infrastructures, for instance, regulated infrastructures, would be beneficial because this shows uh, that indeed uh, you are known uh, by those authorities and there is a high likelihood that at the end of the day what you plan will materialize. So I hope this, this gives the picture what is it uh, uh, that we are looking at. Bonus points. How can we show renewable energy <coughs> additionality without a PPA? What percentage of electricity needs should be covered uh, and to be granted for the bonus point? Gianluca. Yeah, thanks, Roman. So, as I said before, the additionality of renewable electri electricity can be can be done uh, with a PPA. So a PPA, uh, for instance, with economic operator that's producing renewable electricity, but also uh, thanks to the, to the installation, to the specific ad hoc installation of, uh, of renewable energy, of renewable energy systems, or renewable energy plants. So these are the two options that, that we see in order to prove this additional renewable electricity. What percentage? This is a little bit tricky question in uh, the sense that this really depends on the project. Uh, we don't have specific targets uh, in, in mind, but of course this should be important, significant contribution uh, and not, uh, not an negligible, but um, yes, we don't, we don't have specific figures that, uh, that uh, 
can be applied to all the different projects that we receive uh, in the in the call. So this depends really on the on the type of project we receive. Yes, and also the call uh, contains some additional information, especially in the glossary as regards, for instance, green hydrogen production, to which such uh, bonus point would have a slightly uh, uh, important meaning related to our RFMBO regulation under the RED2 directive. So you, know, you will find more explanation of, on that and on what you need to show to, to claim that bonus point also in the call text. Okay, I, I look at the colleagues who show that uh, we have no more questions and also in view of time, uh, I think we will need to close soon. So maybe just uh, to conclude and I'll try to move the slide. Yes, just a couple of uh, concluding remarks from my end. Um, thanks to all for a very, very good questions, and I hope we were able to address at least some of those. Uh, I believe uh, in the meantime, uh, colleagues in the back office were answering uh, many other questions online. Um, so I hope this uh, will uh, this will give you already the very good uh, basis. Um, we do hope that this event uh, pr have provided you sufficient basic information uh, to start uh, working on your project, on your application, the basic orientation on what is it that the Innovation Fund is, what is it that is applicable under this particular call, what are the requirements uh, that you need to understand when preparing your proposal. A couple of recommendations. Uh, maybe which seem trivial but uh, we always are um, surprised when we see projects that uh, uh, hit the button submit uh, one minute after the call closure and and this is very bad for everyone because you have invested enormous amount of time so please have a very good look at the requirements of the call um, uh, there is a lot i already mentioned before on the call website. Uh, uh, we have prepared specific tutorials for you, whether it is on preparation of your application, whether it is on the relevant cost calculation or greenhouse gas emissions calculation, so those that are methodological, and I hope that with those tutorials you'll have a better overview of what needs to be done. Uh, please check the consistency of your application before submitting. Uh, as you know, we have part A, part B, part C, and uh, uh, um, additional documents that need to be submitted. And it's really unfortunate when projects are scoring low scores because there are inconsistencies in numbers or in reasoning. So it's really the question of sanity check before you conclude your preparation and submit your project. Have this in mind because in the rush of the day, most of people simply forget to do this and then uh, you know, we have to evaluate projects based on what we see, not of what we think. Then help uh, is obviously available for you, and uh, I would stress that you will find a lot of information on our website. I mentioned the tutorials, but there is more. Read the call text. Uh, have a look again to the slides from the info days, and have a look at these recordings once they will be published. We have uh, prepared a frequently asked question session on uh, section on the on the portal which includes very important questions and answers that are recurrent and so please have a very good reading of that uh, before you essentially start preparing your project uh, there is a network of national contact points across Europe which is also on the website so uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with uh, your particular contacts in your country we are in touch with them and we are also trying to see ways how we can reinforce the information flow to you when you're preparing a project. There is the Innovation Fund help desk that is open to applicants when the call is open, where you can pose uh, project-specific questions, whether they are methodological or whether they are to specific issues that you see or you don't understand. Uh, and there we are at your disposal to come back uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with answers. And obviously, we have a high IT help desk in case you have issues with the application of the e-grants portal where your application needs to be submitted. So, uh, 
our help desk um, is there for you. We mentioned this before. Uh, but I would like to stress one thing because, you know, we, we have seen in the previous calls also that there are many very generic questions, very simple questions that essentially do not need to be submitted via the help desk because you can easily find answers if you just read the documents out there. I, would, I need to state this because, you know, we are a limited group of people who, who have a capacity to give you uh, the answers. Uh, the more such questions, generic, very easy questions we get, the more time we need to invest into those and the less time we have for very critical, very deep, very complicated questions. So please try to uh, follow our um, uh, proposal. First, read the call document, then have a look at FAQs. And only then, if you have very, very detailed question, please come back to us through the help desk. And by this, we should be also able to reply faster and with the more elaborated answers that will help you further in developing your project. I already mentioned about consistency, conciseness. I mean, we had passed a lot of uh, messages in this respect to you, so please, please have this in mind. Uh, then just a couple of things that we cannot do. We cannot become consultants uh, for applicants. Unfortunately, uh, you have to do it on your own. It's your responsibility, so don't expect us that we will give you every single step uh, until preparing your proposal. We'll help you to get you on the right track, but obviously um, it is your project, so you will, you will do what is necessary for that. I hope this is clear uh, to everyone. And uh, before closing, maybe a couple of words about our next uh, steps, next events. Uh, Alexander Paco mentioned um, uh, that on the 16th of May we will have uh, a stakeholder consultation event about hydrogen auction, which is a novelty under the Innovation Fund. It does not relate to this small-scale call at all. It is a new instrument that will come in uh, hopefully towards the end of the year, but if you are interested, please join that discussion. Um, we will have the next workshop and orientation sessions for you, specifically for the small-scale project call uh, on the 4th and 5th of July this year. Uh, please uh, take uh, this date in your calendar already, book, book the slot. Uh, it is additional support for you. So we will come back with some lessons learned, some more deeper guidance. We will look at the application form examples. We will ask probably some successful projects to come and present their experience so that you get on hand feedback from those that succeeded. And there will be a chance to exchange on, uh, on direct way through uh, an orientation session that will be organized uh, in the afternoon of, of the 4th and on the 5th of July, dependent on your interest. And again, all the information will be put on the website with the registration, with everything. You will be guided there. So please save the date and follow us. We will have a USEF event in June. Uh, so please, uh, on this slide, you see the link. You can see more information there. Again, uh, it will be available upon registration, so you can join both physically, I think, and, and uh, online. Um, and uh, there, there were some questions related to next calls. Uh, so, um, to give you an answer, we are working on this. Uh, um, we will announce soon the planning, I hope. Uh, and uh, yes, the plan is that we will, because of the EU ETS revision, uh, and once we have the delegated act that enables us to implement those provisions legally, uh, we will uh, open also the new category of projects. Uh, so we will have in the future small scale projects, mid sized projects, and large scale projects. And there will be specific topics for those to ensure that uh, we have a better uh, basis to compare and compete uh, between these projects. So this is coming. When this will happen uh, at this point, uh, we shall see. But please follow us. Uh, all this will be published when the right time comes, uh, but our plan is to come with the next calls as soon as possible. Okay? I don't think we have more mm, messages to pass. I'm looking at the colleagues. Okay. Yes, uh, this one, which is more for those, uh, 
people who have the capacity to help us as evaluators. Uh, we are always looking for new experts with uh, the capacity on those sectors that we are covering. You have seen which those are. Uh, so we are looking for technical experts, so people who have on-hand on -hand experience with particular innovative technologies in the sectors we cover, or greenhouse gas emission experts with expertise in LCA uh, calculations uh, on the GHG emissions, financial experts from banks, from financial institutions, but also from companies who understand uh, the balance sheet and who understand the the project finance uh, and again uh, this is an open call it's always open so please come back to us should you, should you be interested to join us as the evaluator we'll be more than happy to receive more new colleagues in the family and i think that that would be it from our end i'm looking for colleagues no more messages and there is a feedback form yes on slido so please uh, uh, help us uh, understand whether we fulfilled your expectations about this event or not. So please fill it in and send it back to us. It will help us to organize the next events probably even better than this one. And again, uh, I'm really looking forward to meet many of you, I hope, on the 4th and 5th of July with some more information. And uh, otherwise, I wish all uh, a good luck for the preparation of your projects. Uh, and uh, I hope that we see many of your projects in the next round when we close the call and we start the evaluation. In the meantime, thank you all for being with us, for following us, for sustaining long presentations, and hopefully they were useful. And uh, have a nice day and bon appetit. <laughs>